All righty, Old Roller Nation, welcome back to the show because uh, we didn't annoy and make him uncomfortable enough the first <laughs> round. <laughs> uh, our buddy, our, our hero, uh, Rob, Rob Bernacki. Uh, it's been a big uh, uh, big episode. You're so far the number two uh, watched episode on the show. Uh, Damn it. <laughs> uh, but you have a good person to trail. You're behind Lachlan Giles. Uh, oh, okay. Well, that's – yeah, that's – understandable rightly Not so yeah. so i'm gonna apologize to the uh listeners uh my microphone uh kind of crapped out so i have i'm gonna have some poor audio if you can hear me i know they'll be able to hear me but just in terms of the audio quality it's not going to be great on my end so i apologize for that but we're doing the best we can wanted to get you back on the show and i didn't want to uh wait for amazon to deliver a new mic to do it no worries so the 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 primary thing that I brought you back for is I wanted to talk about uh, you have some pretty innovative ideas about uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, there's very few uh, schools or associations that I've heard of that have a curriculum from uh, white to black uh, with a set series of requirements uh, all the way through it. And uh, I think, Given my background, that that I would feel very comfortable with that. But I also know within sort of the traditional or you know broader um, hierarchy or, or way things have always been done, that that might you know there might be some resistance to that. So I kind of wanted to get your ideas about what made you say this is something that I want to have, and this is something that I think is important. Because I know you had to put work into it, which means it had to be important. Because yeah, why would you work on something that doesn't matter? So if it was important to you, um, what made it that way, and what, you know what was sticking out to you, and then what have you seen along the way? You know what adjustments have you had to make? You know from the beginning, and uh, you know to to where you are today. Yeah, um, well, I guess there's probably before I get into that too much, I should probably draw the distinction between like what our curriculum is and what most curriculums are because I don't think I'm that unique in having a curriculum. I know, uh, you know, 10th Planet has a curriculum. Gracie Baja has a curriculum. I'm pretty sure um, Alliance or Alianza does as well. Like there are a lot of schools that have. Uh, I definitely know that some of the the older school, um, uh, like Pedro Sauer lineage schools, they've got a very defined curriculum. It's like you got to demonstrate these 80 moves to get a blue belt. And I fucking hate those kinds of curriculums. I think they're bullshit. Um, I think the the majority of curriculums are a, a, a set of fixed techniques that people have to just kind of memorize uh, of varying degrees of relevance or efficacy. I, I mean, there's certainly techniques that are extremely valid that uh, across the board in different you know jujitsu schools you know yeah like an arm bar from the mount that's pretty fundamental everyone should kind of know how to do that uh but in terms of how they're taught and 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 how they're connected a lot of these curriculums are just it's just random moves it's just like you know you know these moves oh is that yeah is that beeping? i gotta kill that i didn't know that my notifications were on <laughs> okay <laughs> thought maybe you were about to get like there's going to be a little laser sight on your uh, forehead there in a second um but yeah the um the the way that most curriculums are structured is, is kind of like the the antiquated you know like the the traditional martial arts methodology it's like you know do this particular kata and show me these five moves and you get your belt kind of stuff and the the curriculums exist for the purpose of allowing testing and I think that's a terrible notion. I think testing, for the most part, in jiu-jitsu is a really bad idea. Uh, so I, what we have is a, a, a modular curriculum. And this is like we have a set of requirements for uh, you know the stripes on your belts and for the, the colored belts themselves. But they're, I don't want to say that they're vague, but they're they're general. So for instance... The, the stripes on your white belt, and, and this goes for every belt. So like the stripes on your belt are for sweeping, passing, guard retention, and like dominant position control. So like back control, that kind of stuff. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got to show me 
you know, this particular sweep or this particular, um, you know, guard retention movement. It's just that at whatever rank you're at, you have to be proficient at doing sweeps and guard retention and passing and stuff like that. That's it's a, it's appropriate. So if you can hit the stuff on white belts and you're starting to be able to hit the stuff on blue belts, that means you're getting close to being a blue belt. Um, and the way that the structure works for the, the actual colored belt uh, promotions is when you get your four stripes, you're halfway to that belt. So if you're doing the sweeping, the passing, the retention, the dominant position control, that's one aspect of it. And then it gets a little more specific. So those things are fairly general. They're just skills that you need. So like you might not be the best at grand being. You might not be able to invert really well where it's like your primary guard retention movement, but you're really good at framing and hip escaping, or you're really good at high legging or whatever. And your guard retention is just really on point. It doesn't hugely matter if your ability to invert isn't the best, as long as you're able, you're functional. And so you're halfway to your belt. And then the specific things are for blue belt, you need to play two guards, uh, a longer range and a closer range guard. Okay. Doesn't matter what they are. You need to have a B options for passing. So it might be a knee cut X pass combination. You have to have a B options for submissions from the dominant positions. You have to have A, B options for escapes from the dominant positions. So again, I don't care what they are. I don't want have somebody to have to demonstrate this technique. And if you don't demonstrate it, you're not getting your belt. You're just developing skill sets. You're developing proficiencies. And then from every belt, for, oh, and you need to have one leg attack, which is usually a straight ankle lock, uh, just because that's what's legal at white belt for everybody. And so it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, but we've got a lot of white belts that are good at heel hooks. So it's, not, it's it doesn't matter what they are. And then for, um, to go from blue to purple, it's those same four things, passing, sweeping, retention, et cetera. Uh, only now you got to demonstrate them against good blue belts and you know early purple belts. And when I say demonstrate, I mean during rolling. I have yeah. to see you doing this stuff on a regular basis during rolling. Yeah. And, and you've got to be able to um, do pressure passing and movement-based passing. And you have to have an overall understanding of the leg lock system. Those, you don't have to be great at heel hooks or knee bars but you have to know what the positions are, how to get in and out of them. And so that's an added, and then for brown belt, oh, you have to play play three guards. For brown belt, it's four. For black belt, it's five. Like you just have to have more, it, it's, it's a really simple curriculum. You, you just, you have to uh, progressively increase your understanding of jujitsu and progressively increase your ability to perform the fundamental movement patterns that make up the most important aspects of rolling in jujitsu or of competing in jujitsu. Uh, you have to progressively increase that against better and better people. So by the time you get to be a black belt, you can kind of do a pretty good amount of what jujitsu <laughs> involves mm -hmm. against really good people. And, but it also leaves you the, the freedom to develop things that are more specific to your interest, your personality, uh, your body type, traits, et cetera, et cetera. So like, you know, I, I, I've got two homegrown black belts, Rory and Cal. Yeah. And they both do the some of the same fundamental stuff, but in terms of their styles of passing, their styles of guard and the submissions that they favor, they're quite different. They like they don't use the same guard games. They don't use the same passing games uh and the, in terms of what they're they like what I've got to watch for as far as submission threats when rolling with them. It's quite different. Uh, although, obviously, like they're very, you know, anyone that trains with me is going to be good at attacking the back. They're mm -hmm. going to be good at the Kimura control. They're going to be like, there's certain submission systems that we use. But I like, I don't remember the last time Cal even threatened a triangle choke on me. Whereas with Rory, I got to watch out for that. So, like, that's an example of a, a submission that one guy favors, the other guy not so much. Um, so, yeah, like that's the, the point of the curriculum is that. We want to create a, a structure for people to maximize their learning and be able to have a, a self-expressive form of jiu-jitsu uh, once they get to black belt. And also people do need this, like, you know, they need the pat on the back. They need the, you know, the, the goal of, you know, what do I need to work on to get to my next belt? 
And so mm -hmm. that's the other aspect of it is I think at most places, you know, if they have a curriculum, then it's like, do these, you know, memorize these 50 techniques and you're, you're, you're studying to the test. You're preparing to do these moves and then you don't really do them when you're not preparing to test for your, um, for your belt or there are no clear requirements and it's just, well, whenever the instructor thinks you're ready, which leads to a terrible um, environment, I think. It leads to this uh, cult of personality where the teacher knows all. You're never supposed to ask what you're going to, like, when am I getting my next belt? What do I got to do to get my next belt? Oh, you asked about your next belt? That means your promotion is delayed by a year. Mm -hmm. That is culty shit, and we should not uh, encourage that or, or participate in it. So, you know, if somebody wants to know, hey, what do I need to do to work on my purple belt? I'm like, well, you know, for your stripes, of the four skills, your guard retention is really good, your passing is really good, your back control needs some work, you know, your sweeping needs some work. Uh, and, you know, what are your three guards? Oh, I play single leg X, I play butterfly, and I play closed guard. I'm like, oh man, your closed guard needs a lot of work to get to the next, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, I can have students come to me and they can give me a simple question that's very general. What do I need to work on? And I can give them very specific answers because the requirements are so clear. So that having clarity in the requirements while still having uh, enough variability, enough uh, modular aspect to it to make it so that everyone can find their way, so to speak. And no one's in the dark about like, you know, what do I do? Do I get, what do I focus? How do I adjust my training and all that? So that, that's where the work came in. The work came in. It's not so much like I got to sit down and, have a list of a hundred techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I just had to figure out a way to make it clear to people what they needed to work on, and then, but still give them a lot of freedom to develop their own style. So, what was the the impetus for you to to create that that system of promotion? Uh, and and the reason I ask that is every instructor has you know, the, the right and honestly the obligation to promote within their own standards. Uh, but your standards, uh, as you express them, um, are not nebulous. You know, you're, they're, they're, they're concise and still with a range so that, you know, someone, as you said, can express themselves. So what brought that about as opposed to uh, just like going by intuition or I think he's a purple belt now or, or something like that. You know, what, what, I, what, I mean, what, what, what brought that, I mean, it, it's two things. One is I, I took a look at the, the, you know, the landscape of promotions in jujitsu and I found it extremely wanting. Um, I, I see, uh, I just see a lot of things that I disagree with in the way that jujitsu is taught and the way that, um, the, the, the culture encourages the development of cults of personality and just cults period. And I'm as an individual, I have a huge amount of problem with authority, both just, uh, I think temperamentally uh, as, as a, as a child, but also as an adult who, you know, sees the world going in a really bad direction as far as, um, authoritarian impulses being encouraged in certain countries. Uh, I, I think that being um, suspicious of authority is a good thing. And you know, we could get, we could go down a rabbit hole with what the word authority means because we, we have this unfortunate circumstances in society where people are, are suspicious of uh, legitimate authority like doctors, but they're not suspicious of, you know, their leaders which is, I think, a terrible state of affairs. There's, there's different kinds of authority. There's, uh, there's vested authority, and there's authority where somebody is an authority on something. Like I, I always tell my students, I'm an authority on strangling people in their pajamas. I, I have a lot of knowledge on that, and that makes me an authority, and I want to share that knowledge with you. But I am not a person who has authority over you. I am not able to command you what to do uh, when you go home, when you leave the gym and even within the gym, you know, there's certain things that, that are requirements for, for our safety and for our ability to learn. But if I can't explain to you why those things make sense and why you should follow them, 
then you shouldn't follow them. You, in other words, you shouldn't follow the things that I say just because I say. That is a pernicious form of authority. And I see that as being somewhat pervasive in the jiu-jitsu world where it's like, well, you know, are, is somebody such and such belt? Well, yeah, their instructor says they are, therefore they are. And, I mean, it, it, you know, on a factual level, yes. When your instructor says you're this belt, then you are. But it's like you said, it's nebulous. It, you either have this, you know, the, these curriculums that are just horseshit. They're just a collection of techniques that are rife for abuse. Where like you, you learn the technique, you demonstrate it, you get your belt, but you haven't demonstrated proficiency with rolling. You just randomly demonstrate. Like if you want to see some some absolute trash jujitsu, watch some of these like YouTube videos where people are doing demonstrations for a. A, a belt and the guy obviously isn't that skilled and they're demonstrating just these nonsense techniques and that's all you need to watch to, to recognize that that approach doesn't work. So then the alternative was, well, the teacher will just know, he'll know when you're ready. He'll, you'll just kind of feel like a purple belt. And I don't agree with that either because like I said, it's for one, it's rife for uh, developing a cult of personality. You know, teacher just knows all, which I think is bad. But it's also right for just uh, a lack of integrity and abuse uh, and bribery and like people paying to get black belts, which you know happens all the time. You know, we talk about yeah. fake, we talk about fake black belts, right? There aren't very many fake black belts, right? Like in the sense that somebody just self-awarded themselves a black belt. But there are tons of fake black belts in the sense that somebody awarded them a black belt for completely fraudulent reasons, right? So. That's what you create. You create the opportunity for that. You know, at our gym, when we do promotions, I can just straight up tell, I can ask the class, I'm like, hey, who do you think's getting their blue belt today? They'll be like, so-and-so. Who's getting their purple belt? So-and-so. Everyone knows because this, the, uh, the requirements are so clear. So it, it no longer becomes about, it, does Rob think that you're ready? Because for one, I'll consult my other instructors. I'll say, hey, you know, like I don't see this guy roll as often as you do. How is their guard retention? You know, what are they able to do this? Like, is their Kimura control on point? So the standards are really clear. And, you know, yeah, maybe I hold people to a high standard, but it's because I believe they can achieve it because we make the standards so clear. So the reason I did this was just because. I, when I designed my curriculum, my teaching methodology, when I try to uh, like design or influence the atmosphere at my school, I wanted to reflect these notions that I have about people thinking independently, about not holding me up as being uh, you know, something more than I am. I, I, I've, I've talked about this to a certain degree. I, I don't know if we talked about it last time or if I, I, I just, I did another podcast not too long ago where I, I mentioned that I have uh, kind of metrics for how to prevent myself from abusing the power that's given me by the fact that people think that black belts are magical. No one's above it, right? Like everybody, I, I don't care how pure of heart you are and how noble you are. Somebody gives you enough unchecked power, you will abuse it. Uh, and so the idea is to have systems in place at my academy that prevent me from becoming uh, you know, more of an asshole than I already am. Uh, so it, it, you have to have that sort of stuff in place. And that's part of it is the, the rank structure is so clear and the process is so clear because I never saw a really clear, good one before. So I figured, you know, uh, let me come up with one so that I don't have to be the one who's making the decision behind a curtain. And then everyone's just got to follow what I say. Yeah. Listening to you, I'm taken back to my my history. Uh, you know, coming up in in flight school, um, flight training is very very expensive, and therefore it has to be very regimented. You can't waste a minute because every minute costs the students so much. You know, and um, so in every course, we would have at least two, but sometimes even three, what were called progress checks. And so the, the course would progressively um, become more and more difficult throughout itself. And a third of the way through, or maybe two thirds of the way through or halfway through, you would have a progress check. And what it was is to, 
to basically demonstrate within the, the proficiency of a check ride that you had met uh, the standards of whatever whatever uh, essentials you were working on. So take, for instance, learning to be an instrument pilot, and that's a pilot who can fly in the clouds uh, and navigate. So the first portion of that, the first third of that course, there's no navigation. It's what we call BAI or basic attitude instrument flying, basically just flying on the instruments with no reference to the ground. So you're buzzing around like you would if you were just looking out the window, but you're doing it only by looking at the gauges, right? right. Then the second part of the course, you take away all of that. Once, you, once you've passed that check ride, you've shown that you can fly an airplane just with the instruments. Now we take down the level of complexity of that way, uh, way lower, but we add in basic navigation. So you're just flying along on courses and routes that are, you know, radio navigation aids, and they're pretty broad, pretty wide standards. And when you can demonstrate that, where you can turn off of one course onto another and, you know, backtrack a course and all these different things that you're going to need to start to tighten those standards in, then you have another check ride there. And that's to demonstrate that you've got all the basic navigation. And then the last part is doing the approaches, which is that's where the, the standards are so tight because the runway is only 150 feet wide when you get to it, you know, so you have to be really, really close when you get there. So the last part is building on those first two foundations. And so it sounds a lot to me like your stripe system is kind of what we would consider a progress check from aviation where uh, have you developed this set of skills, which are going to be foundational to move to the next set? Have you built these fundamental parts of the structure so that we can then put the structure on top of it? And the next belt, we would say, might be the demonstration of that level of structural integrity. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the thing that's really important to distinguish, uh, and again, I, I might be repeating myself a little bit. It's been a bit of a long day. Uh, but the thing that's important to distinguish is when we're learning jujitsu, the, the common misapprehension I find is that people think you're learning a bunch of techniques. And if, if that's what we focused on, if it was like, and because uh, you could still design a pretty you could design a pretty good curriculum around that, right? Like you could be like, okay, like let me let me just do a quick like uh, review of what are the techniques that work the best at the World Championships and at ADCC, you know, for the last ten years. Okay, here's a list. Let's just do that. You could build a really solid curriculum out of that, but still be like you wouldn't be training the like the intangible stuff. So it's like you mentioned, like you have to build on top of a set of skills. Um, so again, I, I don't know how to directly analogize that to, to flying, but I'm sure if like if all you were doing was like learning how to use like flaps and ailerons, but you didn't have any idea how to navigate. It's like, well, okay, cool. You know how to do this move and the airplane does this move, but if you have no idea where you're going, was that a good analogy? Absolutely. There you um, go. Okay. So if and, you had you could we, we right? just use that that the flaps and the ailerons part, what we would call that basic attitude instrument flying there to you demonstrate go. that you really can fly the shit out of the airplane by the instruments. But that's not the whole purpose of the course. The purpose of the course is to get you places. But in order to be able to do that, you got to be able to fly almost like unconscious competent. Yeah. So when, when we're trying to get to like the black belt level in jujitsu, uh, and I say like the black belt level, because that means so many different things to different people. Um, my kind of personal view on this, I think we talked about this before, is like I think a black belt in jiu-jitsu is like a PhD. Mm -hmm. So you should have pretty extensive knowledge. But if we want to make it like less – because that, that could still be really vague for some people. If we want to really – because I was just having this conversation with someone earlier today, like a, a visitor to my academy. Um, not visitor in the sense of like visiting student program because I should be like somebody who has visited – uh, and is, has moved to town and is training with us for a little while. Uh, so he is, um, we were talking about like what makes a black belt. And basically I was like, look, if you can't roll competently with like good black belts, like professionals, um, 
then you're probably not a black belt. Like the, if, if you roll with somebody whose job it is to do jujitsu and they just mangle you, you're not a black belt. Like, don't get me wrong. I, if, if I roll with like a, an elite competitor black belt, they're going to beat me. But like, it, it won't look like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Right, like I will, there'll be, I will have a similar set of skills to them. I will be doing the same movements. They'll just be doing them better because they're a professional athlete and they will have a level of strength and conditioning and speed and timing that I don't have. But we'll be doing the same thing, right? It's like at a certain point, I'll fatigue and they'll take advantage of that. <laughs> but if you watch us roll, it won't look like I don't belong. So to build that kind of skill, you have to be building, uh, you know, again, if, if you just decided on certain techniques, there would always be something missing. If you decided on a certain uh, type of guard and you decided on certain submissions, like where you could get all the way to black belt and you could have like a wicked closed guard. And again, this is usually my go-to analogy for like guys who are black belts that shouldn't be black belts. It's like, if they get you in the closed guard, man, it's murder. But if they can't, their guard retention is so far below black belt level that a good purple belt will just walk around their open guard. That to me, that there's, that, that's just, you're not a black belt. If you can't, if you don't have good enough guard retention, if you can't adjust to certain things, if you, if you've got like a phenomenal pressure passing, but you're just dealing with a guy who's got a really good ability to just shut down pressure passing, and you can't throw in some movement-based passing at a fairly high level of competence. You know, if you're, again, like nowadays, if you're a black belt and you don't have a damn clue how to defend the modern leg lock game because you, you only do IBJJF rules, you're not a black belt. <laughs> yeah, like that's, uh, you know, you can, you can say that I'm a gi black belt. Like, all right, cool, but like that's, that's really limiting, right? Like, you know, I, the, the guys that I respect the most are guys who, you know, they take the gi on, they put the gi off, or they take the gi off, they put the gi on they're still really good. They can find a way to, to get you either way. So to build that kind of grappler requires this, you know, these, um, these, uh, these checks, as you say, it's like, if you're, if your guard retention at white belt is at white belt, that's fine. If it's at white belt, when you're a blue belt, that's not fine. You know, you, you can have, I've got guys at my Academy who are like, when visitors come in and roll with them, they're like, so what that guy's like a brown belt, black belt. I'm like, no, that guy's a blue belt. Like, are you fucking kidding? Because he's mm -hmm. awesome at this. He's awesome at that. He's awesome at that. I'm like, yeah, but his guard retention is dog shit. His this is that, you know, da, da, da. so like you can have a phenomenally well-developed couple of pathways that you're just really good at. You know, you get, uh, you know, I had a guy at my school who's just got this unreal guillotine game and dude, on the regular taps brown belts, visiting brown belts like four or five times around. He's a blue belt and he's going to stay a blue belt until his guard retention gets better or until his or whatever. Right. Because like you can't be a black belt if you don't have black belt level guard retention, you can be a black belt and not have a black belt level spider guard. You know, you can be a black belt and not have a black belt level triangle choke. Honestly, like you can have a competent triangle choke, but if you don't have black belt level guard retention and that's not something you could ever demonstrate on a test, right? Like show up on this day and show me guard retention. That's really hard to do. That's just something that somebody's like, if anything, that's where competition comes in. You want to show me guard retention, go out and compete and pull guard, but leave your feet out. Let the guy try to pass your guard. Let me see if you can hold up at that. Like that's kind of what it has to be. So if we're not creating these, uh, these building blocks, these movement patterns, these systems, then you're creating a grappler who has mastery of certain techniques, but will always have huge gaps. And that's a really incomplete uh, way of training somebody. So by, by having this curriculum, we're encouraging people to learn again in this modular fashion where you're not learning techniques, you're learning skill trees, you're learning skill sets that apply all over the place. And then you can plug the techniques in That's, that's really easy to do. Just spend a month working on, whatever, you know, working on your triangles or working on your uh, heel hooks, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got the delivery system, if you have really good guard retention and you get like, if you've got really good passing and you want to get good at leg locks, that's actually a lot easier than you might think 
because people are tarting out and sticking their legs in your way to keep you from passing their guard. And then all you, and if you already know how the, the leg control systems work, you know standard ashy, you know outside ashy, you know 50-50, you know 411. It, spend a month working on your braking mechanics and your dig mechanics, and you're going to be a really good leg locker. But if you didn't have those skills to begin with, and you start trying to learn that stuff at brown belt, and you don't have this type of, and you don't have that, it'll take you a year or two to become a proficient leg locker. So it is having these layers of skills uh, and these fundamental movement patterns that relate to other things. Just, uh, it, it just makes you so much more effective and efficient as a practitioner and just as a student. You know, I, I, I liked uh, what you said there about, uh, you know, guard retention and, and um, I, I know from, you know, previous conversation with you that, you know, you're really big on the, how important guard retention is and that there is, I'm going to make this word up some nebularity, uh, yep. in, uh, ways to teach it. Uh, and you know, one of the, one of the ways that you've put together is, is using, uh, uh gamifying it and, and things like, uh, the, the fuck your jujitsu, uh, uh, games to create situations where the, the, the individual student can use different pieces of the guard retention movements and uh, techniques and methods that you teach and kind of put together their own guard retention method. So long as it yeah. works, it works. Yeah. Uh, and then you can do the same thing with uh, uh, sweep prevention and, you know, like finding your base and uh, being able to actively post and, you know, things like that. Yeah. And so, um, the, the concepts that you're laying out are very much like the same concepts that we had in aviation. Um, it's just w what I was getting at. And I, and I really expressed it poorly. I think is that the test is there. The progress check is there to say this fundamental, this foundation has been built. We can move on and put something on top of it or you fail and it wasn't. So we got to go back and we got to retrain. We got to get you to this point or we can't take you further because we're about to compound the level of complexity in the next phase of the course. So if we haven't mastered this lower level of complexity, and I think things like fuck your jujitsu reduce the total complexity down so that, you know, you're isolating and uh, building, you know, those, those, uh, fundamental or foundational skills so that later on you can build the house on top of them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, and that's also kind of how the curriculum is designed. It's like, there's a reason you start with two guards and then go to three and then go, you know, there's a reason that we don't try to teach uh, white belts pressure passing. We teach movement based passing uh, until you get your blue belt. And that doesn't mean, sorry, like when I say teach, we'll teach pressure pass. Like if you're a four stripe, white belt and you attend the 201 class you can work on pressure passing it's just it's not part of the requirement and we don't try to teach beginners how to do pressure passing because it, it, even though people tend to think of pressure passing as being simple in that it's like you know there aren't that many pressure passes and it's you know you're you're incrementally crawling up the body in terms of the level of uh, proprioception and uh, like understanding of your own weight distribution and understanding of the other person's uh, like ability to shift that weight and, 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 and where they need to be. It's, it's literally impossible for a, a, you know, a beginner to be able to do it. Beginners throw their weight at the problem. So they will, will just get reversed constantly. So they need to learn the control of their body first before they can move into it. So it's to say, it's like once you can do certain things, then you can start to learn pressure passing. Once you can do other things, then you can learn this, then you can learn that. So we, we, we've developed the games to enable that in training and we've developed the curriculum to, again, like create a, a concrete set of requirements that's vague enough that people can kind of find their way in it. Um, and the idea behind the like it's like you say like the, the increasing level of complexity the idea behind it is that uh, kind of as we talked about earlier the um, the standards for black belt and even brown belt frankly are high enough that there's a, probably a decent number of people that would not meet it 
So p part of what I've tried to do, because I'm I am an advocate for this, I I don't think everybody who just trains long enough should get a black belt. And so that part of the 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 design of the curriculum was as we increase the complexity, there's a breadth of skill and a depth of skill mm -hmm. required for black belt that people should be able to hopefully without too much like bitterness be able to just resign themselves to you know what i'm not willing to put in the work necessary to meet those requirements i train twice a week i don't dedicate myself you know i come and i roll for fun i don't roll with purpose i don't take extra time to develop certain systems or certain things I'm probably not going to get to black belt by doing that. And th that'll have two potential uh, like outcomes, I guess, which is one, somebody will realize that like, you know, they'll, they'll be getting to their purple belt. They'll be like, damn, this is taking a while. Whereas <laughs> that other dude got his black belt in five or six years and he's kind of an idiot. So if he can do it, you know, if fucking Rory can get his black belt in six years, <laughs> you know, it, it can be done. Like, uh, so, you, you could either realize that, hey, the way I'm training is not going to get me there. Whether I train for five years or 10 years or 15 years, I am not increasing the level of complexity that I'm able to adapt to. Because that's all we're really doing. It's, we're, we're going, you know, as, a, as, a, as an organism, as a society, as a whatever, we, we keep going, we climb the ladder of complexity, right? Society is far more complex now uh, than, it, than it was 20 years ago, than it was 50 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, this momentary blip of you know, stupid people deciding how we live, it, it's, a, it's a blip, <laughs> you know, like the, 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 those people won't be in charge for that long. Uh, so as we escalate up the ladder of complexity in jiu-jitsu, you're just, you're going to have to train in a way that makes it possible for you to have all these different skills. If you're not willing to do that, it's got to be okay that you're like, hey, man, I'm going to be training for 10 years and I'm not going to be a black belt because I just wasn't willing to put in the work to master that level of complexity. Whereas if we just say, yeah, you know, you've been training for a while, <laughs> here's a black belt or here are the moves you got to memorize to get this belt. Here are the moves you got to memorize to get that belt. Then you just train kind of hard for a month you pass the stupid test and then it doesn't matter. Then you memorize the next set of moves that get you the next belt. And it doesn't matter that you're not that actually skillful. So to a certain degree, because teaching any higher level skill should require a good foundation so that you can escalate the complexity and still be able to express those foundational concepts very easily. It's like you said, it's unconscious competence. By the time you get to black belt, you're not thinking about guard retention. You're not thinking, oh, that guy did that, therefore I'm going to put my hand here. That just happens totally automatically. Uh, so, you know, if we had a test where I was like, demonstrate the high leg against the, the leg drag, it would be laughable to, to do that for a black belt. It's laughable to do it for a blue belt because the whole point of it is it's the timing. It's knowing the context. And so what we want where people are encouraged to learn what is the right context and timing for this and how do I train for that over the course of half a decade, a decade, so that at the end of that period, like I can just do all this shit. I, you know, like you, you mm -hmm. shouldn't be a, a black belt and have somebody ask you a question about a pretty fundamental thing and be like, I don't know, I don't really do that. <laughs> like that, that, that's just not something that should happen. So if that means that somebody stays at purple belt, after they've been training for 12 years, like I think having this kind of curriculum makes that a little bit more palatable. I, you know, I could be wrong, but that was also part of the design. So your experience within that, um, I know you have a, a pretty large academy and uh, I think you've done uh, fairly well for yourself, uh, you know, on the teaching front given uh, the DVDs and whatnot. I, and you know, you got fanboys, so that. <laughs> Uh, w when you say things, um, I, I know there, there's going to emotionally, there's going to be some pushback from people who would say, well, 
you know, there are guys who maybe they're not as physically gifted or, or, you know, maybe they're closer to the, you know, can't do, but can teach. Like, you know, there, you might have somebody who's a black belt as a teacher, but maybe not able to physically demonstrate the, the skills uh, that, that you might think would be a requirement uh, for, you know, for having that black belt. I personally think that, you know, if we, if we look at the standards and say, each teacher has a right to create their own standards, then so do you. Right. So I don't, yeah. I, um, th the, but the, the pushback that I could hear someone saying is what about the, the guy or gal who physically doesn't have the, 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 the gifts, so to speak, but they can elucidate and, and help other people along the path, uh, in a way that, that does have validity. Does that play into that metric? Um, honestly, no, because I don't agree that that exists. I, I, I don't think that because I, maybe I need to more clearly elucidate what I mean when I say that somebody needs to have these skills. Can we have a battle of, uh, the of, of elucidation? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If I can explicate, if I can, uh, <laughs> oh, we have to look that one up. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, like the, the standard is and like again i just i know from personal experience having trained with literally every level of black belt that exists you know i've trained with local c competition black belts like guys who will you know win at the the like the regional ibjjf level and i've trained with guys that will uh you know like are, are much better than that but they're not going to win at worlds like they'll you know like they won't even medal at worlds but they're good enough that they if they were to show up to like a regional event uh, and there were just local black belts there they would definitely win that event every time like they would beat the local black belts but yeah. they're not going to win a world championship and they're probably not even going to medal so like there are tears and then you know like i've trained with guys who are you know they're just Enough to medal at worlds but they'll never win gold because to win gold is another like tier and then there are the god tier guys who win five six gold medals at worlds and they will beat those guys every just so, like man there are so many levels to black belt so you know like when i say somebody needs to be able to roll with someone like that i like i just use myself as an example i'm not that physically gifted like at all i'm not a good athlete i i never excelled at any sports in school not like not even excelled like i didn't i wasn't like on the basketball team like you know let alone varsity or any like that kind of shit you know like i suck at sports uh i'm i'm tall and i'm thin so people th associate that with being athletic i don't have genetic athleticism i don't have explosive strength I don't have a lot of endurance. I don't have a body that holds up well to a lot of training. Like when I train a lot, I just get injured. So like my ability to, um, there's some, cause there's, there's so many different kinds of athletes, right? Like you can be yeah. an, a, a super explosive athlete, you can be an endurance athlete. And then some guys can just be successful athletes because their body will endure a volume of training that enables them to get very good. Right, and I think jujitsu that exists probably in jujitsu more than in other sports. You don't have to be explosive, you don't even have to have great endurance. If your body can handle a high volume of training, and you can just get insanely technical, like I would probably use Damian Maya as an example of that. Like Damian Maya is not a good athlete, <laughs> like on any level, right? Like he's not fast. He doesn't have a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers. And he gets fucking tired in his fights. Like he gets exhausted. His cardio is not off the chain. But he's technically as good as you're going to get at jiu-jitsu. And that's what has him succeed at MMA. That's what had him succeed at Gi and ADCC and all those things. So Damian Maya is just a great example of a guy who brought no athletic gifts to the table and was still excellent. And like I'm like the average... Because like I'm the average black belt version of that. I don't have endurance. I don't have uh, speed. I don't have any of that. And I don't even have a body that holds up the high volume of training. What I do have is a like just enough of a functioning brain to look at other sports and other systems. Because like a lot of the stuff that I get kind of credit for, like oh, it's so innovative that you have this this curriculum. 
Like, not really. I just look at other shit and I'm like, oh, well, that works over there. It'll probably work in jujitsu. Like, you know, it's like you're talking about how they do it in, uh, you know, when you're learning how to fly. Like, I study other things. I study other sports. I study, you know, the, the way that people teach other activities. Yeah. You know, like my recent sort of thing is car racing. So I've taken high performance driving courses. I see how they teach a skill that, you know, all guys think they're good at, but all guys actually suck at, which is driving. And, you know, like it's, I'm, I'm good at being a student. Like one of the best compliments I've received recently was, you know, when I, the last time I went to a, a lapping day at the track, one of the instructors was like, you know, you're a really good student, which is rare for people who teach other things. People who are instructors at something else tend to make miserable students because they are a little like caught up in their head about the fact that they're a teacher and they, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just come in, I'm like, no, nah, I'm probably going to suck at this. So let me learn as, as much as possible. So you have uh, race car driving. Are you familiar with the uh, 24 hours of lemons uh, racing series? I, I, I've just recently found out about it. Yeah. So if, if you ever want to build a, a, a 24 hour lemons car, uh, I'll, uh, I'll do a team with you. Uh, oh, awesome. Oh man. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry. I was saying that, um, and I'm not uh, trying to derail you there. It's just uh, yeah, yeah, no, because and you you will because I'll forget what I was talking about because if we start talking about cars, man. Um, but yeah, the uh, the idea is that I've just taken stuff that I that that obviously works well in uh, you know subcultures or sports or or activities that are far more developed than jujitsu, and I've just tried to translate them into jujitsu, and so that's all. I just had it like I've got enough functioning neurons. To, to come up with a methodology that's uh, that's good enough for taking schmucks like me and making them competent enough at jujitsu that when I go and I roll with like a, a comp competition black belt and then an elite competition black belt and then a world champion level black belt, again, they're going to beat me, but it doesn't look like I don't belong. And right. so if I can do it, it, I think anybody can do it. Like that doesn't mean that they'll have the same results. Like ultimately at a certain point, the body fails, right? Like uh, I'm still not quite there yet. Like I can still roll fairly well, but a time will come when I, I can't, there will be diminishing returns, but you still got to demonstrate the skills. And, and again, I see it. I see it among students of mine that are in their fifties and they're not in good shape but they're working on the skills and they're able to do them. If they were to roll with somebody really good, they're going to lose. I'm not requiring my, you know, like to get a black belt for me, you got to be able to do a round with an ADCC champ and not get submitted or some nonsense like that. Like that's ridiculous. Anybody who is a high level competition black belt is going to sub a regular black belt in a round sometimes multiple times that's okay they're gonna pass your guard that's okay when they do will it be because you just had no fucking guard retention or will it be because you did the guard retention movements five times and then the guy got you on the sixth one because he's faster than you are and frankly better than you are because it's not just the athleticism aspect it's like when somebody trains full time they're not just faster and stronger than you they are better than you. They're precision. Like, you know, when I say I can have a decent role with a, an elite black belt, when I say that they beat me because they're a better athlete, they also beat me because they're better at jujitsu. So I'm yeah. not trying to take that out of the equation, right? Like, I just want us to be playing the same game. I want us to be doing the same movements. I want us to have a similar level of understanding of what these movements are and where they go. And you can't have that level of understanding if you can't physically perform the movements. So, you know, like I, I'm, I will give a black belt at some point to a guy who is probably getting their ass kicked by some of my other black belts, but he's going to be doing the right things every step of the way. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it ha let, let's say it takes a, a really good black belt, like an elite kind of competition black belt, 15 steps to submit you, right? Like goes in, there's a hand fight, 
you lose that hand fight. They get to a passing position. You frame them. You hit escape or you you do a, you know, a guard retention movement. They go to another – so now we're like six or seven movements in, and then they pass your guard on the third attempt, and now we're ten movements in. And you throw up a really good defense, but they take your back, and then they trap your arm, and then they choke you. And that took 45 seconds. Are you not a black belt? No. If you did all the right things, like if you did all the right steps – and they were just a split second ahead of you every step of the way. You did every damn thing right, and they just beat you to it. Okay, you're, you're still a black belt. Like, I'm not trying to have this, like, ridiculous standard. Mm -hmm. I just want them to know the things that will make that a battle. It should look like a battle. Even if you lose every one of the battles along the way, they were battles that existed because you had the knowledge to have a battle. That's all I'm asking people to do. I I like the the way that you put that because that that does reduce that sense of like okay, you know, an, an ADCC champion is going to have a level of athleticism that, you know, most most of us, you know, cannot compete with. But when we're talking about timing and technique and does it look like that person is in the fight? Or does it look like, you know, there's two fights happening where one is, you know, at, at a very high level and then, you know, our person who's getting their ass kicked doesn't look high level. It, they, they're doing the wrong stuff. Yeah. But I think I, I, um, I think I, I can definitely uh, track with you on that, that idea that like the, the black belt isn't necessarily about winning and losing, but it's about being on the, the right battleground. Like if you were in the right place, and you know you just happen to get beaten. That doesn't mean that you weren't in the right place. It means that you got beat. Yeah, that's exactly. And like, it's it's literally impossible to like to have that stand because like, you know, if you've never rolled, and when I say you, I'm, I'm talking like to the audience. If you've never rolled with like an elite black belt, actually, the, the funny thing is, like, I'm probably gonna go off on another like tangent here. Like, I've rolled with people who like people who visit my school as part of the visiting student program, right? Like of all belts, right? Like purple belt, brown belt, whatever. Guys who are pretty experienced, but they're at a, like when I say experienced in the sense of like, they've traveled a lot and they've, they've trained with a lot of different people. And, you know, they're like, a, you know, they're like an all right blue belt or purple belt. They're not terrible. They're not great. They're certainly not like a pro competitor level. And some of those guys, honestly, they think I'm a lot better than I am. Because like I'll roll with them and they'll be like, hey man, like you know, like kick my ass a little bit, like show me what you can do. Like sure. don't hold back. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. Like I don't like to do that with people, but like if they ask, if they're like, hey man, show me what you can do. Or if they just come in with like a bit of an attitude and they're like, I always say, like, you 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 set the music, I'll dance to it. So like <laughs> if they come in and they're just like being real aggressive, I'm like, okay, fine. And I'll just like sub them like six, seven, eight, ten times in a round. And they're like, holy shit, dude, you're really fucking good. Because they've rolled with some other like famous competitor that subbed them like in, in a similar fashion. And they're like, it feels like when I rolled with so-and-so. And I'm like, man, that's not because I'm good. That's because you suck and you can't tell the difference. Like you're so low down that you literally can't tell the difference between me and an elite black belt competitor because – your rate of mistakes is so high that we're both able to exploit it at the same rate. Like whether it's me or some dude who's on steroids and trains six hours a day, if you're making a certain amount of mistakes and your defense is that porous and shitty, I'm just going to sub you a lot. Of course, that doesn't mean I'm that good. So it, like when you don't know what the battleground is, or when you don't know how big your mistakes are, Mm -hmm. It can seem like a regular black belt is like a god. And then you, you get these stories from people who are like, man, I thought my instructor was good. And then I saw him roll with so-and-so and that guy just lit him up. Like, how is that possible? Uh, well, that, because you're actually like your frame of reference for your instructor was off. It's not that that guy is so much better. It's that your instructor is not as much better you know, as, as good as you thought he was, it's just that you're really not that good. 
So yeah. you know, like it, 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 the to the average person off the street who comes in and rolls, I've got blue belts that if you were just like a, a beginner white belt and you came and rolled with my blue belt and you rolled with me, you wouldn't know that I'm better than that blue belt. You have no fucking clue because you're just so bad that that blue belt can tap you every 10 or 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's almost impossible for like at a certain point, you just can't beat anybody any quicker, right? It's like, if I'm just tapping you every 10 seconds, that's a pretty high rate of submissions. Right. I've got blue belts that can do that to guys, right? Like they'll just tap you every – if you have a certain type of offense, if you've got a good uh, set of submissions from enough different places, you can just be tapping people all the time. It, it, we're not the same level, right? So like there's, there's so much misunderstanding that goes on in the jiu-jitsu world because there's so many people who are so far below even just understanding what the battles are supposed to look like. That they don't that's why we have so many shitty black belts like i've seen my students roll with you know brown belts and black belts where they literally come in they take a grip and they pass their guard with one movement that shouldn't happen i don't care how old you are how like what your lineage is what any of that if somebody just grabs your pants and moves your legs to the side and goes to knee ride you shouldn't be wearing that belt that's just horseshit so yeah, like that. I, I think that there's a there's a level at which now the exact same exchange can happen where I grab a, a grip or you know a, a, an elite black belt grabs a grip on a regular black belt. That guy does the right things. The elite black belt makes two movements side to side, and boom, he's past the guard. That can still happen. And again, if you don't know the difference, if you're not really educated on what this stuff is supposed to look like, you'll be like, well, what's the difference between what Rob just said? That guy grabbed the pants and went by the guard, and that other guy grabbed the pants and went by the guard. What's the difference? And that's where, again, if you can see what's actually going on, if you can see the little, like, the minute, uh, the minutia of, of the exchange, you can have an exchange where six moves happened in one or two seconds. Or you can have an exchange where one move happened in one or two seconds. Yeah. And if you can't see the difference... Yeah, and so like I said, there's this there's this misapprehension about what I mean sometimes when I say you got to roll at this level, you got to be able to do this, you got to be able to do that. You just got to know the stuff, you know. Like I I, I roll with uh, with people that I'm able to still dominate in terms of like, hey, let's you know from zero to me tapping you, how long does it take? Well, it took thirty seconds, but in those thirty seconds, there were thirty movements, and then I roll with someone else. And from zero to me tapping them, it's 30 seconds. But in those 30 seconds, we had three movements. Yeah. So if you're just watching it happen, you're like, yeah, but what difference does it make? Well, there's a huge difference in the amount of movements that were exchanged. So that's the that's all I'm talking about is the, the standard is still the standard. you got to know the movements. And if a superior athlete with better technique and timing gets through you on every one of those movements, it's okay. You still know the movements. I call what you're talking about there the the grappler's eye, um, and I, I had such a hard time. And, and when I say had, I I still have uh, such a hard time developing that uh, because sometimes I would ask my instructor, you know, like we would have we would have a role, and I would be like, well, you know, you caught me with this. What happened there? And and uh, you know, it would be a situation where what I would think happened was not what actually happened. You know, it was like, yep. there was a lot of stuff that was, that was going on that not only did I not react to it, I didn't even perceive it. Um, and it, it, it goes back to what you were saying about pressure passing. And I, I like what you said there that you, it, it takes a while to develop pressure passing. Uh, for me, pressure passing and the close guard were the two things that came the very latest because I feel like, they're both kind of a game of inches and yep. um, the sensitivity to know when you're, you have an inches, an inch worth of advantage and uh, you know, being not all that well endowed, I'm trying to you know <laughs> take advantage of it. Make every inch count. Yeah. But uh, that to, to be in that, that slow methodical battle where, you know, the tiniest differences in, in, 
even rotation of the small muscles of your ribs will will make a difference in how whether or not you're going to get swept or you're going to advance um that to go back to our goofy term here that's very hard to elucidate uh and you and it comes by feel i think that's one of the reasons that that uh things like fuck your jujitsu are are such a good thing is because it gives you the time to develop the sensitivity uh yeah and so i i um i totally um I like what you said there. And, and I have a hard time, like I said, with my instructor, uh, I have actually had numerous about, about every two or three months. Um, I would, would get a private lesson with him and we wouldn't even exchange technique. It would not be like, okay, this is how you do an arm bar. Or this is how you make your arm bar better. It would be, what are you missing? You know, what are you, what are you, tr what do you need to see? What do you not see? What are you not experiencing that's happening around you that, that you know you don't you don't have the perceptive ability to to comprehend yet and honestly that's a hard you know pill to swallow i i i study pretty darn hard and to be in a in a situation where not just once or twice but often there's things that i'm not even seeing um is is it like i said it, it's it's i don't want to use the word humbling uh, because it's 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 not disappointing. It doesn't hurt my feelings. But you know, there are times where you know he'll 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 say something, and I'm just like, clearly that's obvious to you. But it's going to be six months before I can even see that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And and I mean, it's again, it's it's just it's it does go back to that curriculum idea where it's like we need people to be able to develop in a way that builds on their ability to perceive so you know like when when we talk about uh, you know the, the amount of guards that people need to be able to play yeah you know, as you go on and on you're still always going to have your primary guard and your secondary guard and so like for instance by the time you get to be a black belt yeah i want you to be able to play a few different guards like if i went like sort of off the top of my head i can probably play you know, maybe a dozen guards, like reasonably well to where if I'm rolling with anybody other than somebody I'm like, that's at my level or better, like basically if I'm going to have a role that's for fun, right, as opposed to like, okay, I want to see where I'm at. Sure. Um, I can play, you know, any one of a dozen different guards, maybe more if we start including like geese specific ones. But if I'm going to like, okay, I want to beat this person in a role and I know they're good or I'm going to compete, then I've got like three, like, you know, two, two or three, right? Like you're going to go to that. Yeah. Um, and so if we were just just adding random, like, okay, at this belt, you got to be good at this guard. And at this belt, you got to be good at this guard. You'd never develop the depth. But because, you know, you start with a, a closer range and a longer range guard. You, you always, you just need to have tools for different distances. Most likely those first two guards that you gravitate to, those will be the guards that are your most developed guards at black belt. Mm -hmm. Occasionally some people will find a guard at purple where they're like, Oh man, no, I really like that. And they just go all in on that guard. Yeah. And that ends up being their primary guard at, at black belt. But for the most part, it tends to be uh, like for me, I, I still like when I compete, I end up in the guards that I was mostly playing when I was like, you know, much earlier into my journey. Like all, all the stuff that I've developed from like brown belt on, the only one of those guards that's become a go-to guard for me is De La Hiva. Mm -hmm. But besides that, like I used to play a lot of half guard and then I played like butterfly, single leg X, leg entanglement guard. So like, depending on how you want to parse it, th those can be different guards. Um, so yeah, like if I'm going up against somebody who I know is like really damn good, the only newer guard that I can make work against that is De La Hiva. Um, and, you know, and then Mantis, which is a variation of that. Sure. So... Yeah, like that's – and that's a reasonable thing. We we want to be able to develop like over time your ability to perceive the the battles that are happening just gets, 
you know, bigger and bigger. So the, if you've been playing a guard for two years, the amount of different battles you'll be aware of is just going to be lower than if you've been playing a guard for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's okay. Right. Like, again, like you don't have to be a black belt at all those guards, but you got to be able to play them. And so that's where, again, like, you know, if, if I'm rolling with somebody and I'm trying to evaluate whether they're a black belt or not, and they're playing their fifth guard and I cut through that like butter, I'm not going to say, well, yeah, that guard sucks. You're not a black belt. <laughs> I'll recognize that that's still a guard that they're developing. But if, you know, if your main guard is butterfly guard and I just insta pass your butterfly guard, then you're not a black belt. You know, like it's, it's just that, that same sort of thing, right? Like it, it's, it allows for increasing your, it's called your, your perceptual lens, right? Like the, the, the perceptual lens will increase your ability to perceive the the various battles like i right now because of covid our classes look very different mm -hmm. so are there you know the, the classes have a fewer people in them it's the same people working with the same people so what i'm able to do is uh, like as an instructor it's been very interesting I'm, I'm actually trying to take this as an opportunity to figure out how i can take the level of um attention and detail and learning opportunities that we have now and hopefully translate them into the bigger classes when things go back to normal yeah. because uh like you know there's been a couple of incidents where people have been like man i'm just loving classes right now because i get like i'm learning so much mm -hmm. it's like yeah because i'm able to sit down with you and go over a, an amount of battles an amount of exchanges that I just, there's just no way I could teach that to you before. If you're a white belt and you're learning, you know, how to do a half guard sweep and there's 30 people in the room, man, it's so much harder for me. And I mean, that's just true of a private class versus a group class. And sure. da -da -da. But there's, there are definitely elements of what I'm seeing in classes now where, excuse me, we can take these, these positions really and make people aware of some of the battles that will be occurring in those positions. And it's probably more important, actually probably, it's definitely more important that somebody have an awareness of, you know, there's this battle, there's this battle, and there's this battle. Um, rather than, okay, I'm in half guard and I'm gonna try to do this sweep. And it, like that, I mean, I try not to teach like that anyway because that's just a bad way of teaching. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out ways that I can make people more aware of what are the battles you need to have. And mm -hmm. don't worry so much about, this. like if you're trying to do this technique and the guy's stopping it, well, then just have a different battle with them. Don't try to force this to happen. So uh, that the thing we're fo able to focus on now is increasing people's awareness of the, like you say, like the perception of, this and then this and then this so like what is a a two or three step process against a white belt will be a five step process against the blue belt will be an eight step process against the purple belt etc cetera, etc cetera. and 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 you can make them aware of that without demanding that they master the eight steps you know because they're like how when i roll with this guy who's a you know this is a white belt talking when i roll with this guy who's a a purple belt i'm not able to make this move happen on him i'm like well, no shit. If you could, he wouldn't be wearing a damn purple belt. So, like, there's literally no way for you to be able to engage him in all the battles you need to win, let alone win them. You don't even know how to engage in the battles. And that's okay. It's like you said, it'll be six months before you have the perceptual lens to see the battle, let alone win the battle. But yeah. just knowing that, it kind of makes it okay. It takes the pressure off, like, well, why can't I beat that person? Because not only do you not have the skills to beat them, you don't even have the skills to engage them in the battle that you need to win. Right. So when you when you know that, you're not stuck trying to do it. You're not stuck trying to sweep that purple belt because you know you can't. What you're doing is like, I know that I have to have these two battles right now to get to that third battle that I can't even have with that person yet. So what will I focus on? I'll focus on these two battles because maybe I win one of those battles, right? Like, you know, th there, are, there are ways that if you reduce something down to uh, its constituent parts enough, somebody will have enough skill 
at one of those things to beat somebody who has a lot more skill in the overall area. And that's what, again, like with fuck your jujitsu and with some of the other games that we do, we yeah. can have, we can give a white belt enough skill that they'll be able to compete with a purple belt in this one thing. And because they're not trying to win the overall battle. You know, what, what you're describing there with, with fuck your jujitsu was literally the thing that saved my ability to stay uh, a jujitsu practitioner uh, because initially you're losing everything just everything sucks and you're just getting killed and so that that was taking like i won't say an emotional toll on me but it certainly wasn't you know. no it, th that is the right word like i know um there's this like what was uh, oh you know who puts it really well is um preet mickelson uh, and, uh he has a thing it's like it, it's okay that you lose it's, it's not okay that you don't know why you lost. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good way of putting it. Like as a beginner, you're going to lose. But if you know why you're losing, it's okay. If you don't know, it's emotionally taxing. It's why people quit because they don't see any possibility of not losing at some point because they have no idea why they're losing. Exactly. And and I had to I had to really learn how to find the smallest battles the smallest victories, the, the tiniest, most obscure, bizarro, embarrassing little victories. Yeah. So my, my buddy Jason, who would literally guillotine me 15 times in a five-minute round, could I turn that into 14 times in an arm bar because I made him take the arm because the yes. guillotine wasn't there? If I did, then I won that one guillotine ex exchange. You know, it's like it was 14 plus an arm bar. I won today, and I'll go home, and I don't want to have to kick my dog. You know, <laughs> <laughs> have, do you um, do you follow tennis at all? Uh, you know. I, uh, I played tennis uh, when I was a kid, and when I was in college, I actually lived in the same building with our our school's tennis team, yeah. and they used to give me free lessons because I, I worked at a pizza place, and so I would give them free pizza, and they would like basically you know let me fart around with them and stuff. Yeah. So, I, so do you do you know who Jimmy Connors is? Uh, who? Jimmy Connors? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So there's a great just apropos of your like 15 guillotines. Jimmy Connors uh, played a, um, a a European player. His name was Vitas Gariolitis. You probably haven't heard of him. No, no. Uh, so he, uh, they had sixteen um, matches in a row, and Jimmy Connors beat him sixteen times. And the seventeenth match, Vitas Gariolitis finally won one. And in the uh, the, uh, the 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 post match press conference, he said. To, to Jimmy Connors, he just he pointed out, he said, let that be a lesson to you. Nobody beats Venus Gariolitis 17 times in a row. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Jason would beat me pretty much at will. The, and this is another true story. The first time I ever tapped him, the first the, – it may be the only time, but at least the first time, uh, uh, he had put me in mount – and I was trying to escape, and he he bore all of his weight down into my gut, and I just ripped this just <laughs> tremendous far. I mean, like everybody in the gym stopped. That's how loud it was. And he goes, "God damn, man, you got me today." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, you got you got to take your victories where you can get them. I went home a happy guy. I was like, "Tap Jason today." <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like, I, I, again, I, I don't remember if I covered this last time we spoke, but like when we do our intros for new students, uh, one of the things I mentioned to them is this idea of like, if, if you're going to do jujitsu, especially, you know, if you're coming into our school, you're a beginner, you are most likely not going to tap anyone for six months to a year. And when you do finally tap someone, it's probably going to be because somebody new walked in the door that knows absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And if that's your metric for success, you're going to hate jujitsu. You're going to quit. If your metric for success is I recognize that somebody was controlling my wrist and that was a lever and I did something or if somebody grabbed my head and I recognized that my posture was broken. If you have all these little things that are 
those are the victories that you can you know hang your hat on at the end of the day you can leave class having won 15 times because you recognize those things even if you got tapped five times you won more than you got tapped and yeah. if that's how you approach training you're going to enjoy it learning will be easier it'll be better it'll be more fun you will feel better about yourself you'll want to come to class so if people understand that more than anything else uh, like if you're a beginner to jiu-jitsu if there's one thing I could get you to understand, I don't even care if you understand alignment or base posture structure, because you'll get there. Like if you come to class enough, you will get there. Everyone learns, you know, everyone learns everything we want to teach them. Everyone learns everything they want to learn if they just show up enough. But yeah. if they don't show up enough because they fucking hate it, then it doesn't matter what, what the information is that they're getting. So that is the most important thing for a beginner is just, have those little victories and feel good about yourself at the end of the day. Yeah, it's it's tough, uh, but I can definitely say that that is the what made the difference for me is is if I had stayed with that concept of like I'm just getting my ass beat, then I would have had to have quit coming in because it 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 was it it was beyond a stressor. It was like a distressor, you know. Like my I was starting to have like. Uh, 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 emotional disorders about it. <laughs> yeah, no, and and this is another like you know I I, I complain so much about the deficiencies in how jujitsu is is taught and communicated to people, and that is a huge thing, especially when you consider like depending on what your demographic is, uh, you know, of students, there are people who are going to take that really hard. There uh, for for various reasons, right? Like uh, people gravitate to jujitsu to jiu-jitsu for different uh, you know, motivations and solutions for, for problems in their life. Uh, and depending on what they're, uh, why they're, they're, they're gravitating to it, they may be so distressed, they may be so demotivated by that process of constantly losing. And if we just have this attitude, they're like, well, jiu-jitsu weeds out weak people and it does this and it does that. Like, well, I mean, don't get me wrong, it does, but is that the purpose of it? Like, are we trying to create the, the you know, the Navy SEALs? No, we, you know, we're trying to give people something that's fun to do. If you can build someone up into someone who is not a weak people, uh, yeah. then you're not selecting for the tough. You're actually creating the tough. And I exactly, I think that's more artful. Uh, and I agree. I, I certainly think that the person who needs us most, if we would talk about it from a self-defense standpoint, is the mm -hmm. person least capable of demonstrating toughness um, on a, from a physical standpoint when they walk through the door. In my opinion, they've demonstrated a great deal of toughness from a mental emotional standpoint by walking through the threshold. Now it's kind of our job to uh, not, as, to use Joel Bain's uh, uh, language, who as a catch wrestler, most people would think that, you know, he's probably just going to beat the crap out of you. But he said, we're here to build you up. We're not here to beat you up. We want to turn you into something that can be tempered and can handle, you know, some really tough training, but that's not day one. That's, you know, uh, down the line. Once we've, we've built you up into someone who can understand it and who can dish it out and, you know, who can, who can protect themselves from it. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's just, again, it's a, it's a it's a failing testament to the culture, the overall culture of jujitsu, that we cling to some of these archaic teaching and training methodologies, these archaic training environments that, like, there's literally no science behind them, and not only that, all the science is in the opposite direction. Like, there is a a ton of information out there on, you know, sports and uh, learning and 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 how to you know, create any number of uh, individuals in any number of um, of activities out there, and none of them involve any of the fucking horseshit that we do in jiu-jitsu. And like the the earlier we start abandoning some of that stuff, the better off we're going to be. Well, I uh, I think we've covered a lot of the the things that I wanted to cover. And once again, I can't thank you enough for your insight and your time. Uh, every time I leave a conversation with you, I, I, uh, I just feel like I've, I've, uh, upped a level and, uh, thank you also, you know, just having the chance being a Kentucky boy, I don't get to say elucidate all that often. So, 
not in polite company. <laughs> uh, and I'm not trying to pretend I know what that means. I'm just saying it. I'm repeating it after you said it. So uh, hopefully I get okay. that. Uh, but uh, these these chats are are uh, really helpful to me uh, personally and, and help me to understand, you know, in a way the standards that I want to hold myself to. Um, and uh, th this this podcast in general, but specific uh, the the interviews with you uh, have been really important to me, and and I hope uh, that by sharing them with the rest of my uh, old roller brothers and sisters, you know, um, uh, I can help you know a lot of people uh, through this show to uh, to come to a deeper understanding of what it is that on their own individual level uh, they want to achieve. Because I feel like you know what you're trying to accomplish is to help people to have a greater expression of themselves through jujitsu. And, and it's not, yes. it's not a, okay, I understand Rob's system or, you know, I get the leg lock theory or, you know, base posture structure, blah, blah, blah. You're really trying to help people build a foundation to, to be able to express the, the, the physics and the science uh, to such a level that it becomes their art and it's not your art. It's their art. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, uh, you know, it, it's funny as a, as somebody who's got a little bit of uh, notoriety or like, you know, uh, quasi fame in the, in the online jujitsu community, uh, you, you kind of have to pick your, like, you know, what are the things you're going to focus on, uh, expressing and the things you're going to focus on teaching. And for me, it's very much been, you know, some of these concepts, some of these systems, because, uh, you know, I did see a lack of it. Um, and so I, I'm not out there trying to like, um, I guess, expose as much of my personality as possible. I'm actually trying to mostly just focus on delivering a message. Uh, <laughs> but if I was going to like, I, I think you, you really hit, kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of like a personal goal that is like, it's like a, uh, it's an intended consequence of the way that I teach as opposed to an, an unintended consequence. An intended consequence is that uh, people should come out of the other end or at the end of it. It's like, you know, you, you learn all these things and these systems, but they're not rigid in a way that prevents self-expression. They're actually designed to enable people. It's like, you know, when, when somebody's a really uh, uh, like a talented artist, it's because they know the fundamentals of how to paint or how to sculpt or how to play an instrument that they can then go beyond that and turn it into self-expression. And so I, I definitely, as much as I talk about science and I talk about like, we need to have a concrete way of doing this and we need to, it's all in service to the individual. It's all in service to giving you the tools to be as good at jujitsu as you can be in whatever way you want to be. Um, and, and to have that, because I, 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 hopefully I'm not like, cause I get like, wh whenever I talk about anything that's not jujitsu, I, I really hesitate to make any proclamations like outside of my field of expertise. So I, I try to remember what, you know, other, what experts have said. So if I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know, car racing, I'll try to quote, uh, a, a, you know, a car racing instructor. If I'm going to talk about any science stuff, I'll quote whatever expert I, I studied. And so if I remember correctly, you know, a huge part of, you know, art or expressing yourself as an artist is that you're seeking truth. You're seeking okay. to express truth through art. So in jujitsu, if we don't have a, a solid set of movements if we don't have a solid foundation if we don't have good guard retention if, we don't, if we're just giving people belts for no reason and you can say well i just want you to express yourself so here's a black belt express <laughs> yourself yeah well the truth is you fucking suck so what you're expressing is garbage right and so i don't want people to express themselves in garbage ways i want people to be able to string eloquent sentences together and express themselves in a really that fashion with jujitsu, I want people to be able to express themselves in whatever manner through jujitsu in an educated way, where they can develop, uh, you know, whatever their potential is, they can develop to fulfill that potential. And that's why I spend so much time and effort on these systems and on becoming a better instructor. 
and on learning, you know, the most cutting edge stuff, whether it's for jujitsu or just, you know, pedagogy and studying that kind of stuff. It's because it's, it's become my version of self-expression and I, and, and I see it become that for my black belts and I see it become that for, uh, people who train and uh, yeah, I just, I want people to be able to express themselves honestly. And if we don't have certain standards, then that expression becomes dishonest. It becomes, well, yeah, he's good for a 50 year old guy or he's good for a, this He's good. I want people to be able to say, no, man, he's good. He's just good. Obviously a 50 year old black belt is not going to be as good as a 25 year old black belt who competes all the time. That's implicit. That's implicit in the human experience, you know, uh, but you, you shouldn't have to be like, oh man, he gave that guy a black belt because he's 50 and he feels sorry for him because that becomes an expression of dishonesty for both parties, right? It's dishonest on the part of the person giving the rank. It's dishonest on the, like, man, I've had so many conversations with people who are just like, I don't want this rank. Not, not with me, but like people who train somewhere else and they're like, they're trying to avoid promotion ceremonies because they know they don't deserve the rank. They don't want the belt. They don't feel like they could possibly wear it and feel like they're being honest with themselves. And so it, it just, it does a disservice to everybody. So like it, on every level, if you're trying to express yourself, if we're trying to have this be an art, there has to be an element of truth to it. Yeah. I, when I think about that, I, I read a, a blurb about uh, uh, Pablo Picasso. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, Picasso is known for cubism and, and uh, you know, some of the avant-garde uh, art that was having a, a very low-level eye of art. I look at it, and it looks almost like gibberish. But yep. the, the fact is uh, that among the, the school of artists and the, the, aid, the era of artists that, that Picasso grew up in, he was the best classical artist. He was the best any kind of art. He was literally the one that everybody else was like, we wish we were as good as that guy. So yeah. his final expression was, uh, you know, so far beyond my level of perception that, like I said, it looks like gibberish, but if you have an eye for art and you know that, you know, if we were, if you and uh, Pablo Picasso were both doing classical art, that P Picasso's classical art would, would, make yours look like gibberish, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. um, there's, I think there's an element of that within the, uh, with the expression of, of jujitsu, uh, if we were to talk about the art, you know, and, and science of it, um, when we talk about those perceptive differences, um, and to say one, you know, like if it's obvious that someone does not demonstrate a level of skill, uh, commensurate to uh you know like an accepted standard of, of a belt level then i can i can totally uh jive with the idea it's like well he's he's good but he's not going to be a black belt it's not there yeah. yet, you know uh there's a level of of dedication to craft that has not been demonstrated yet uh if it if that changes then so will the rank um uh, yep. and and i i think that's just like you said there's an honesty in that um and that's tough, especially, you know, we look at, um, you know, certain elements of uh, American society. Uh, and I, I can't speak for Canadian society. You, you Canucks seem like a pretty nice bunch. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Americans, you know, we, we expect, um, you know, a certain level of uh, regimentation and then, you know, uh, reward and benefit for uh, uh, being a part of something. And what you're describing may not jibe with that cultural element of, you know, uh, uh, American society, but that doesn't make that incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. I like I said, I don't proclaim that like the way that I'm trying to like set it up is the right way. I do think it's a little bit more honest. No, it's a lot more honest. I should, I'm being uh, I, I'm being false right now, uh, because it, it, you know if, if we're going to claim that jujitsu is a, you know a certain set of things, then we, we have to be realistic about uh, people who are not capable of certain things don't get to be standard bearers for for jujitsu, 
And to me, a black belt is a standard bearer. So if we're just going to change the definition of it, if we're just going to say that, you know, it means something different, then that's okay. But if it's going to mean what it has, what we've so far for the most part claimed that it means, then, uh, you know, people should be held to a higher standard for the most part. So, but that, yeah, it, it, it that doesn't mean that I'm right about it. <laughs> it's if, you know, if it, it, it depends on what your goals are. My, my goals are to, um, you know, to teach to a high standard. Uh, my goals are for my students to be able to walk into any room and be able to wear their belt and not have to hide their head. Uh, my goals are the, to elevate the level of instruction in the art because I think one of the reasons we've got such abysmal standards is because it's, it's not the fault of the, like, the person who inherited the, uh, the methodology for teaching and for promotions uh, because they don't know any better. No one taught them how to teach. The reason we've got such shitty standards is because people don't learn how to be uh, good businessmen other than to be shady and use like bullshit marketing tactics and give people belts no matter what. People don't learn how to be good teachers. Like there are a lot of, there's a, uh, there, there are a ton of reasons why belt standards are as wacky as they are. Uh, and so it, it's for me to just come down and say, oh, belt standards are shit, change them. That that would be, you know, it's like if you complain about a problem, you better have a solution is kind of how I'm trying to look at it. So if I'm going to be the guy who complains about rank standards and that they're not that great at a lot of schools, what am I offering as a solution? Like, well, I, I, this teaching method and this uh, curriculum and this method of ranking and this method and this. So like, I've, I've got the solutions. If, if I'm going to bitch about it, I want to offer the solutions. And I think I do, uh, whether somebody agrees with my complaint and then wants to implement the solutions, that's up to them. Um, but I do think that at the very least, if we're not going to be honest about it, we create a lot of problems in, uh, in our community. We, we, anytime you, have a an amorphous set of standards, you're going to create problems. Whenever we, we talk about things as being supposedly concrete, but they're not, you're going to create problems. You're going to create dissatisfaction. You're going to create anger. You're going to create, like just all kinds of things. Whereas if you're just really honest about it, like uh, most gyms, they have the competitor track and they have the hobbyist track. And the standards are very different for those people but they don't talk about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you get guys who are like, well, why the fuck did he get this belt? And I didn't because, well, you're on a different standard. Oh, didn't we tell you? Well, maybe we should, right? Like, I, I so like if, if we're going to not follow or not listen to my complaints, that's fine. But if we're not going to listen to the complaints, then we should probably be a little bit more honest with the people in our community uh, about the reason those complaints exist. Yeah, and you know, people want, I think that there's a level of fulfillment, you know, once you get past like the age of, I, I don't want to throw my uh, not quite that old rollers under the bus, but, uh, you know, kids and stuff don't have a sense of necessarily wanting to be held to the highest standards, though some do. I, I definitely have seen kids who, yep. they, they want to be uh, challenged. Uh, but as as you know, uh, we get a little bit more mature. I think that there is an allure and a sense of fulfillment and reward from being held to a high standard and being you know being able to meet it, even if it takes long. You know, it takes it's a lot of work and, and a challenge uh, because you you know that when you have met it, you can you can look at it just like you said. There's people who maybe get a belt and they don't feel that they deserve it. I mean, mm -hmm. think about what a disservice it is to that person to give that to them because every time that they look at that, that that's a bad feeling. And I think you want your your student when they acquire or achieve or uh, uh, are are awarded a belt to say, well, yeah, because I did the damn work. You know, like there's no question in my mind. It should be it should be like I'm proud of this thing. I, I definitely know that I've earned it. I agree. I think there's a almost pathological and dysfunctional uh, selfishness that comes with just doing people to doing things to make people happy. 
where you'll uh, oh yeah i mean that it'll make them feel good well not not really like the if 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 you're going to be dishonest to make someone happy there's a cost to that uh and if that's the only way you operate like i said there's a there's a pathology to that um and it, it just it creates problems uh so if you're going to create that kind of dishonesty about rank where you say that it matters but it doesn't you say that you have standards but they're too vague they're too nebulous then you're you're definitely going to end up giving someone a rank that they don't feel they deserve uh and the, the the feeling of earning something is unlike the feeling of being given something mm -hmm. and uh, i mean you know again i don't want to be one of these like well back in my day because i don't i think that stuff is largely bullshit because uh, you know like back in my day there i think there were probably just as many people who wanted to be handed something and not earn it as there there are nowadays uh so I, like i don't think it's necessarily a generational thing i think people want to believe that but uh there are definitely more institutions nowadays that want to give people stuff with lower standards, particularly uh, educationally. Um, and I, like, I, I disagree with that, but I also disagree with arbitrarily high stand. Like some people have high standards and it's just because you don't know what the fuck you're trying to do. Like people think that I have high standards, but like, I actually don't think they're that high. Like I said, if, if a couple of chumps, like, Cal and Rory can get black belts from me. Like, it's honestly not that damn hard. It, it uh, standards become uh, oppressive or uh, insidious when, like we've talked about, we mentioned it earlier. Like when you don't know, when you're like, how do I get this rank? Man, Rob's got really high standards. I don't even know what I got to do to get a purple belt from that guy. I got to be able to do backflips or some shit. Like. No, you just like they're they're super clear, and the way of achieving them is really well developed and defined and reinforced. You literally just gotta show up, <laughs> right? Like the standards are not that damn high, uh, and so I think if we have better teaching methods, it'll be much easier to have higher rank standards because it won't be down to well, I can only make somebody really good at jujitsu if they're a freak athlete and they train six hours at it because I fucking suck at teaching. If you have good, if you invest in being a good teacher, you'll be able to have higher standards because you'll be able to train everyone to meet those standards. And I do think the reason there are such abysmal rank standards is because there are just a crap ton of bad teachers out there who still want to make money doing jujitsu and so the way they do it is they hand out belts and they teach garbage. So that I think the two are they're just they're inextricably connected. And if we address one problem, I think we'll address the other one. People who are good at teaching will make good grapplers. Therefore, when they put a belt on someone, they'll have earned that belt. It's it's that simple. I uh, I think that's uh, I. I I would love to say that that's an obvious point, uh, but it's not. I think it's it's unfortunately uh, one that that requires a lot of thought and intuition to to get to. Uh, is that the connection between uh, um, being maybe not not so great of a business person? Because being a teacher and a business person are two different skill sets. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a challenge. I'll, I'll, I mean, Jesus Christ, look around with the COVID situation. Even good business people are having a hard time. So yeah. This is a this is a tough time. Um, that being said, um, having achievable but high standards and expecting them to be met, like I said, I think people will actually want that. Like there is a business case to be made for giving people a, an environment where, uh, going all the way back to what we were talking about, they can eventually come to a place where they express the art. Uh, in their way, you know, like, uh, and, and their, their rank will be almost, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but it'll just be, um, a manifestation of that. So, you know, like when, when someone is expressing art, you know, uh, that's a, that's a pretty powerful thing. And, and it takes a solid training environment for that to happen. And if that does happen, if there's a culture and a, a training environment where people can come to that, I think that there's a pretty good business case for that too.
I think so too. And it's something that I was more cynical about in the past, but I mean, you know, it's obviously anecdotal on my part, but in my geographical area, we are the successful school and we have made that business case. We've made the case for pursue excellence, help people achieve it, and you will be far more successful than people who are handing out belts and, and don't have a high standard and don't teach very well and aren't very skillful and don't win any competition, like yada, yada, yada. So if uh, like I'm proof of it, I, I'd be interested in a, uh, a large scale, you know, double blind study on, uh, on whether or not that, that, that is actually the case. And I, and I would hope it is like, uh, there's, I, I do think when you're talking about something like jujitsu or a martial art, when you're talking about self-improvement, you would think that, you know, if there's going to be an endeavor where people want to, uh, be held to a higher standard and become legitimately good, it would, uh, th this would be it where they, they're not necessarily looking for the, the easy answer because if they were, they would have done something else. Jiu-jitsu yeah. is not easy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do agree. I like on a, um, uh, just kind of an instinctive level, I do think there's a business case to be made. But I do think that it's harder to do it. I, I think that it's... Especially out of the gate. As yeah. A, like Because you don't necessarily have that you know, tip top level of skill in getting people to that level of expression yet, you know, that takes time to develop too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that if, uh, if people were to look at it from an expedience perspective, they'll definitely go the other route. They will, they'll recognize, like, you know, what, what skills do I need to run a successful jujitsu business? And they'll, you know, they'll look at, you know, time invested in marketing, and they'll look at time invested in becoming a really good instructor and they'll go, I'll learn a bit about marketing and I'm not going to worry too much about being a good instructor. I'll just hand out some belts and I'll be pretty successful. So it's definitely the, the easier route, uh, which is why I doubt that it'll ever become the like, it's not going to become the standard approach to just try to be as good a teacher as you can and create excellence. Uh, as a path to success in jujitsu business. I don't think it's going to become the standard. Well, I think um, uh, guys like yourself and hopefully, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, take part in, in, in accelerating that, that culture across the board as well uh, uh, with, with this show, uh, we can help to make that a more uh, uh, commonplace, uh, you know, strategy so that, every student walking in any door will know that, you know, they're in a place that uh, the culture and the, the training culture is going to be supportive and, and something that can really uh, take them to a high level if that's what they want to achieve and do so safely, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, efficiently. Um, having, I'm, I'm obviously a big fan, but uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, are, uh, to use our word again, elucidated uh, in your, uh, BGJ concepts, uh, website. So yep. if you could give a quick plug to that, because I think we've talked a lot about things that, that kind of revolve around concepts that you've been working on, uh, that, that, uh, that website helps to, uh, to kind of flesh out. So, uh, talk for a minute about that. Yeah. Uh, so BJJ concepts.net or.com either suffix will, will take you to the site. Um, it's my online Academy. Uh, the, the content on there is sort of, uh, I, I mean, twofold in the sense that I, I believe we're the only site that has a section dedicated exclusively to teaching you how to be an instructor. So it's called the pedagogy section. Uh, and then the other side of it is just, you know, the, uh, the, the student section where you can just learn the concepts, the, the, the different drills, the 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 modules the, the the all the 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 techniques and the systems that I would teach you know like if I were coming to your school to teach a seminar I wouldn't be coming to teach you how to be a teacher I would be coming to teach thirty people or whatever how to do the Kimura control or whatever uh, so that you know all that stuff exists we we have a a very uh, hopefully well thought out um, uh, like process so like you start out with the concepts. And then there are drills that will help you, 
like the fuck your jiu-jitsu stuff that we were talking about. We've got proprietary uh, drilling systems, and then we've got 101 material, which is some of the stuff that we were talking about with the curriculum being laid out based on guard retention and passive. So the one kind of teaches you that stuff, and then the 201 material, which is more expressions of uh, submission controls and advanced guards and things like that. So it's all laid out very well. Whereas you know, again, I think a lot of sites are just like, here's some moves, <laughs> try to try to get good. Um, so we've tried to put a lot of thought into that. Uh, all of the modules are progressively taught. So you start out with concepts, you start out with the basic control schemes, you go through some of the fundamental movement patterns that make it work, and then you uh, get to develop the more uh, intricate uh, movements within that particular position. Uh, and if you do want to become a jiu-jitsu instructor eventually, the pedagogy section is a really good resource. Or if you just want to understand jiu-jitsu better, like I think about 30% of our uh, subscriber base gets the, the instructor membership, the pedagogy section. I don't know that all those people are uh, like actively teaching. Um, some of the stuff that's in the pedagogy section is there specifically to help you. For instance, we have um, a, a section in there on tournament coaching. Even if you don't own a school, even if you're not actually teaching classes, if you go and compete and you want to help your teammates because you know maybe you've got a big team and your head coach isn't available to coach at all of the mats and you want to get better at coaching, well, there's a section in there for that. Like that. So like really any any skill that you're trying to develop to help you understand jujitsu, to help you be a better training partner, to help you like, uh, you know, we've got stuff, material in there on how to open a school, how to run a school, all, basically any resource that, that somebody who wants to uh, improve on any aspect of uh, contributing to the jujitsu community. We, we try to have that in there, so that's that's what you get when you're when you're checking out BJJConcepts.net and and you're helping reduce the impact of COVID on on my life, where I, if if my school has to shut down again for two months like it did, uh, you're helping me not you know wake up every morning sweating and shitting my pants that I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. So <laughs> it's uh, it's very helpful right now. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, I'm. Uh... I'm definitely down for that. What I can say um, uh, is that if anybody's on the fence, like, you know, there's obviously economically, this is, this is kind of a challenging time. Uh, but if you can afford it, um, I, I can give uh, my highest recommendation to the, uh, the BJJ concepts uh, website. I've gotten a lot from it. And um, it's uh, I just sorry. Speaking of afford uh, right now, we've got a coupon code uh, stimulus. <laughs> uh, uh, lowercase, uh, and it'll get you 25% off a of membership and a free week to try it out. So if somebody's on the fence, they can check it out for a week, uh, you know, uh, no cost to them. And if they do end up keeping the subscription, they'll get 25% off. So, uh, so take advantage of that, you know, like, uh, this is another opportunity to, uh, really learn and, you know, the, the information there is, is high quality. It's you're not phoning any of it in. If there's anything I could say about Rob, uh, Rob does not fucking phone it in. Like <laughs> everything is well thought out uh, and organized and well put together. And uh, you know, there's there's some geeky humor and there's some uh, phallic humor. <laughs> <I'm a fan. laughs> so you know, like if you're if, if you're okay with that, that'll be. I personally think it breaks it up a little bit, you know, keeps me from getting like that mind numbing, like, Oh, but uh, I, I think so too. I think there's something to be said for that. That is again, I, I think missing in the jujitsu community. Um, it, it's pretty fucking hard to sit down and just watch an hour's worth or two hours worth of jujitsu instruction. You need the odd dick joke here and there. I, I personally, you know, agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and so, like I said, I, I, Highly recommend that. Uh, to kind of wrap up, um, do you have anything that about curriculum or standards that we didn't go over that you wanted to go over uh, that I didn't get the chance to ask? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, like we covered all the different kind of like standards. We covered what what the what the various um, skill sets we're trying to develop, and and we got off on some tangents. So, <laughs> as, as per usual with me, um, yeah, I think that covers it. Well, uh, 
that's uh, basically like that covers everything that I wanted to cover. So let me go ahead and pause the recording here. Uh, once again, thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, thank you. For all my listeners, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and then in the comments, throw a dick joke. You know, it's not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs>